If any of you believe that the Israelis are going to stop and not take Masjid al-Aqsa, you're deluded. 70 years history has shown us that they've literally wiped out the entirety of Palestine. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, wa salatu wa salam ala Rasulil Kareem, wa ala alihi wa ashabihi wa man sabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawmiddin wa ba'd. I respect your brothers, elders, sisters, salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah. Uh, obviously we're aware of what is unfolding in the Middle East, in uh, Philistine, in Palestine. You know, there was a very famous Christian Palestinian academic called Edward Said, who wrote the famous book Orientalism. He said, the Palestinians are not allowed to express their narrative. Meaning that the Palestinians' narrative is never heard. It's always focused on the Israeli narrative. They are never allowed to say, or nor is the world ready to hear what the Palestinians want to say. And this has been going on for now the last 70 years. We have seen how the Palestinians, subhanAllah, have been going through this difficulty. For those who have been to Palestine, will have experienced a bit of that. When you enter Tel Aviv, how although you have a Western passport, you're kept there for sometimes four hours, nine hours, you are humiliated. This happens to the Palestinians on a daily basis for the last 70 years. And we really need to understand something, that the place where the Palestinians are is, subhanAllah, the most holiest place to us after the Haramain. This is Masjid al-Aqsa. This is our first Qibla. If it wasn't for the resolve of the Palestinians for the last 70 years, there would have been not one Salah in that place. This is the place where Sulaiman created Masjid al-Aqsa. How long after the Muharram? In the awwal baytin wudhi ali nas lilladhi bi bakkata mubarak wa alamin. Allah says the first Masjid placed on this earth was the Haram in Mecca. How many years after that? The Prophet ﷺ said, 40 years after that, Masjid al-Aqsa was created. So 40 years after the Haram in Mecca, Masjid al-Aqsa was created. It is the place where Musa ﷺ said, Oh Allah, allow me to be buried by the Ard al-Muqaddasa. And the Prophet ﷺ said, when I went on my Isra, Isra, he's traveled from Mecca to Jerusalem. That is known as the Isra and the Ascension is known as the Miraj. So he said, when I went on my Isra, I saw the grave of Musa alayhi salatu salam by the Ardul Muqaddasa. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam said, do not travel to besides three masjids. There's a virtue to go to three masjids. Mecca, Medina and Masjid al-Aqsa. This is the place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Subhanalladhi asra bi abdihi laylan min al-masjid al-haram ila al-masjid al-aqsa. The most adventurous night in the life of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah says, pure is he, pure is Allah. Who took his abd, his slave, the messenger of Allah, at one night from masjid al-haram to masjid al-aqsa. Nowhere else. He took him to Masjid al-Aqsa. Whatever Allah does, there's a hikmah behind it. And then the message of Allah reached there. This was the beginning of the journey where the message of Allah went to meet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah didn't take him straight up. Allah took him to Masjid al-Aqsa. So the Ummah knows the importance of Masjid al-Aqsa. Allah did not gather the Anbiya alayhi salatu salam in the Haram in Mecca. He gathered them in Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is why Ibn Abbas radiallahu anhu, he says that Masjid al-Aqsa is that Masjid which is created by the Anbiya. The Anbiya lived in that place. All the stories you hear about Musa, 
Isa, Maryam. Where was Maryam? She lived in Masjid al-Aqsa. Her chambers was in Masjid al-Aqsa. All the uh, Anbiya. And then he, Ibn Abbas anhu, goes on to say that there is not a hand span in Masjid al-Aqsa which a Nabi has not prayed. So Allah gathered the Anbiya والسلام, in Masjid al-Aqsa. And the Prophet وسلم, led the Anbiya in the most holy salah ever prayed. Ever prayed. Hundred and over hundred thousand Anbiya. And this is why Ibn Abbas said, no place that you pray in Masjid al-Aqsa, but a Nabi has done sajda there. And subhanallah, whilst we were comfortably praying our tarawi here, our brothers and sisters were in Masjid al-Aqsa, in Masjid al-Aqsa, praying the same sunnah of the Anbiya alayhi standing where the Anbiya stood. And so they are attacked by the Israeli forces. For those who have never been there will never honestly appreciate what these people go through on a daily basis. If it was anybody else, honestly, I believe they would have cut and run. Allah placed them there. That the resolve that these individuals have. But for us, these people are fulfilling the fard kifaya on behalf of the ummah, the fard of defending this place. You saw the next day. What do they have? All they have is stones. A few small catapults. That's all they have. The next day, they're in Masjid al-Aqsa, lying there, defending, just in case they attack. For three days continuously, the Israeli settlers, backed by the Israeli forces, attacked Masjid al-Aqsa. And this is why we need to understand that we also have an obligation here. Because slowly but surely, the support for the Palestinians is dwindling, unfortunately. Slowly but surely, Palestine is slipping from the Muslim hands. Slowly but surely, Masjid al-Aqsa, if we don't do anything, will slip from the Muslims. And this is why we here also have an obligation. Look at this. For 70 years, the Palestinians have been minced. What is the West state? West is quiet on the issue. You know, all is speaking about human rights. Soon as the Palestinians respond and react, that's when the clock starts running. So when they were being attacked in the masjid, in the Ramadan, in the last 10 nights, nothing. Hardly any of the Western countries said anything. Soon as Hamas fired a few rockets, you have Dominic Raab coming out. All oh, the Israelis have the right to protect themselves. So the clock always starts, according to them, with the reaction of the Palestinians. So the land can be usurped. They can be abused. Their children can be killed. As we speak, 39 children have died in Gaza. 39 children. 119 individuals and 39 children. Imagine if this happened anywhere else. Imagine, imagine if a, an army had gone into the Vatican and attacked the Vatican. The world would have been up in arms. Imagine if the world, if, if, if the world had just attacked some other place, maybe some synagogue. The world would have been up in arms. Charlie Hebdo, the world was up in arms. But a group of people who have been defending, you know, been, whose land has been usurped. Gen the general principle is this. You side with the oppressed and not the oppressor. You side with the occupied and not the occupier. This is one rule. This does not apply to the Israelis. When it comes to the Israelis, 
you, you side with the Israelis. And this is why even the Western world are very muted. And the Israeli lobby, there's no doubt about it, there's a very strong lobby. You can speak about Iraq, you can speak about Afghanistan, but as soon as you touch on the Israeli issue, all of a sudden you will be attacked. There's no doubt about that. I realize that. Because they're very connected and they're very well organized. You look at the world. Europe is criticizing China, and rightly so, for what's happening in Xinjiang. Because it's China. R Europe is criticizing Russia because, and, I put, and Britain wants to put sanctions, and I put sanctions on the Russian because of Crimea. Because it's Russia. When did Xinjiang start? Just a couple of years, a few years ago, Crimea, when did it start? Just a little while ago, Palestinian 70 years. 70 years. And nobody says a word. Everybody remains quiet. Tacit approval. Because there is this belief that there will be no accountability for the Israelis. And they know that. And that's the reality. And this is why with impunity... They will kill, maim, attack children. 39 children. You've seen those high-rise blocks, residential blocks in Gaza coming down. Honestly, if you, most likely most of you have never been to Gaza. I've been to Gaza. It is a concentration camp. Nothing goes in, nothing goes out. And the Muslim world is complacent. And the Arabs are complacent. And that's a reality. Gaza borders with what? Gaza, Gaza borders with Egypt. The most populous Arab country, Arab Muslim country in the Middle East. It borders with it, but the borders are, are, are shut. And this is why... Brothers and sisters, Allah has given... We need to do the little that we can do. Look, look, Biden recently. Biden said that they want their foreign policy to, build, to be built on human rights. That's their claim. This is why they are saying that we, we accept that the Armenians... It was a genocide was committed against the Armenians by the Ottomans. That's what they say. Because our foreign policy is based on human rights. So he's the first president in the history of America who has accepted the Armenian genocide. You want to talk about history. You want to talk about history, but you can't change the current. Four billion dollars of your money goes to support, every year goes to support Israel in their tyranny. Because Israel, whatever it does, it does it. And it knows that there will be no accountability. I know you get confused. You look at, at the Muslim world. And you look at the leaders. And the leaders are normalizing relationships with Israel. And you think, well, it can't be that important. Wallahi, I say this and I've said it before. If for the rest of your life, you never ever hear a khutbah, in the world regarding Palestine and Al-Aqsa, if never again a Muslim leader ever mentions Palestine and Masjid Al-Aqsa, the obligation still lies on your shoulders because Allah spoke about it. The Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam spoke about it. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave glad tidings to the Muslims that they would come, that you will, be, you will take Masjid Al-Aqsa. That Sham, the entirety of Sham will be yours. And this is exactly what happened. So if you never ever hear, you know, you hear these muted responses from the Muslims. Even, you know, subhanAllah, we've come to a time where celebrities and, and superstars and footballers and sports athletes are actually more vocal than the scholars. You have these, huge, these scholars with this huge following. Hundreds and thousands. Millions. And it's a muted response. 
You know, oh, pray for Palestine. Free Palestine. That's it. Oh, these scholars, subhanAllah, who've got all the why? Because they don't want to fall foul. Because they don't want to lose their following. Because Facebook or Instagram might come down on them. Because their visas may be cancelled when they go to a particular country. Because UAE may not be happy with them. Look at this, subhanAllah. You know, UAE businessmen, believe this or not, UAE businessmen are buying land from the Palestinians and giving it to the settlers around the masjid. And you may be shocked, you say, how is that possible? This is history repeating itself. This is history repeating itself. You know Salahuddin, and I want to re-emphasize this again. This is not an Arab issue. This is a humanitarian issue as a whole, and this is an Islamic issue. It's got nothing to do with Arabs. This is our Ah, first Qibla. This is our ah, third holiest masjid. This is the place where Salahuddin a Kurd. A Kurd. He was an Arab, he was Kurdish. He slept more in a tent than his palace to liberate Masjid al-Aqsa. They said one day to Salahuddin, they said, Salahuddin, why is it that we never see you smiling? He said, how can I smile when Masjid al-Aqsa is in the hands of the Crusaders? His main teacher, Nuruddin, Nuruddin, they had besieged a particular area. And when they had besieged this particular area, what he did is that the, the Crusaders besieged it, and then Nuruddin came with his army, and they settled behind the Crusaders, and they besieged them. And the Muslims are in this place called Damietta, and they've been besieged for a very long time. So Nuruddin said, let's bring the Rahmah of Allah. Let's read the hadith of the Prophet So he called the scholars and they're reading a hadith. And there's a hadith called Musalsal bit Tabassum. What Musalsal bit Tabassum means is that when the Prophet narrated this narration, he smiled. He smiled. So the next person, when he narrated the narration, he smiled to his student, and he smiled to his student, and he smiled to his student, and that's how it's narrated. So when it's narrated, the narrator narrates, because he's following the sunnah of the Prophet And then when the student hears it, he smiles. So the hadith scholar smiled, and he said to Nuruddin, smile as well. He said, how can I smile when the Muslims are under occupation? Nuruddin was the man who created the pulpit. He said, one day when I conquer, one day when I conquer Jerusalem, and we have the khutbah in Masjid al-Aqsa, we will bring this pulpit and we will place it, and the first Juma khutbah will be given. This was Nuruddin's aspiration, but he passed away. But Salahuddin, who was his student, knew the aspiration of his teacher. One occurred... One a Kurd, the second one, what? A Turk. And he bought that pulpit and the first Jummah khutbah in Masjid al-Aqsa was given on the pulpit of Nuruddin. Even today, and this is not the case with all, but even today, you look at the Muslim countries, one of the, those who are most vocal, and nothing's ideal. Nothing's ideal. But those who are vocal are vast majority, vast majority of them are non-Arabs. Because they understand that this is not an Arab issue, this is an Islamic issue. There was one thing, with all their differences, one thing which brought the Arabs together for the last 70 years. And that was the issue of Palestine. These are a group of people who speak one language, who have one religion, and there was one thing which brought them together, and that was Palestine. And even on that, they can't agree anymore. Normalizing relationships, buying properties, giving it to the settlers. Morocco normalizing relationships. What, what really? You're on the other side. You're closer to Spain than you are over there. It doesn't even impact you. Because you know why? Brothers and sisters, do you know why? 
Allah wants to see the munafiqeen in this ummah. Wallahi, Allah wants to see the munafiqeen. 70 years after Salahuddin took Masjid Al-Aqsa, imagine Salahuddin, the, 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 the happiness, 70 to 80 years after Salahuddin, his own progeny, the Ayyubai dynasty, wanted to give it back to the Crusaders on the condition that the Crusaders helped them fight the Egyptians. Because Allah, it's always been the Munafiqeen. And they come in many forms. And when there, but then Alhamdulillah, you have the true believers who trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who on occasion like Ramadan, like the Ramadan attacks, we have the battle of Badr, the first battle and the greatest battle in the history of Islam. You had the conquest of Spain in the, in the month of Ramadan. You had the defeating of the Mongols. The Muslim world was so devastated by the Mongols, they had a saying, in qila lak inna tattarakad in hazmu fala tusaddiq. If anybody ever tells you that the Mongols have been defeated, don't believe them. These people are invincible. In the month of Ramadan, Ain al Jalut took place in the month of Ramadan. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala elevate the status of our brothers and our sisters who are defending the land. I just want to quickly go through something which looks slightly explained to the brothers. I don't think you can see in the back hall, but you'll be able to see in the front. Can you see this? So this was... Uh, Palestine when the British mandate in 1917 you see the blue areas they're the Jewish you see the green areas they are where the Palestinians lived that's it 1917 after the Belfort declaration then you had a migration from Europe from 1918 to 1947 and then you see the population has increased of the Jews, it went up to about 36% in 1917, it went up to 33%. Okay, but you see how it looks, the green period, uh, the Palestinians, where Palestinians live, and the other is where the Jews live. Then we have the 1947, the UN partic participation plan, they wanted to give 65% <laughs> to the Jews and 45% to the Palestinians. So you see the green part of the Palestinians. You see the orange in the middle. That is Jerusalem. That is Jerusalem, all that. So you see how it looks now? Then in 1948, after the British mandate finished, the Zionists attacked and they took everything and they left 22%, which was the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. So that's in 1948. And this is pictures of the Palestinians being driven out. Uh, there were hundreds and thousands, 70, nearly three quarters of a million Palestinians were driven out of their homes. And these are pictures of them leaving their homes. In 1967, you had the Six Day War, which was Israel against Egypt, Jordan and Syria. And they took the Golan Heights, if you look at the top, Golan Heights. And they also took the Sinai Peninsula the, uh, from the Egyptians. After that, then they encircled the entirety of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. So all of it now is now under their control. And they also got the Golan Heights and the Sinai Peninsula. Now let's fast forward, because we don't have too much time, to 2020. Now this is what it looks like in 2020. So, okay, so here you have the palette, all of that blue is the Israelis, Israel. You have the West Bank, and then you have Gaza Strip. And all that red is that everything that which goes in and out is controlled by the Israelis, nothing. You see, now here, this was originally, remember, 22% was Palestine, West Bank. This is what it looks like now. You see the red parts? That's all settlements. And when you, Wallahi, when you grow there, they will tell you about these settlements. They're massive. They're huge. They're cities. And they were telling me that they were like few houses and they're growing and they're growing and they're growing. All the time. Slowly, 
but surely. So this is all that's left. The countries that agree with their settlements and disagree, that's the world. All the green disagree with illegal settlements. America, not sure on it. The bastion of human rights, not sure on it. You've got the, the wall, but well, let me come to this. Checkpoints. These are the checkpoints in the east. No, wallahi, nothing goes in and out. It's the entire humiliation. You have to get a word permit, even to go into your village. You've got these uh, checkpoints that you have to go through. They're manned. You are humiliated. Your women are humiliated. Your wife might be pregnant. They might say you can't go through. And you, your wife has to give labor in the car. Day-to-day -day humiliation. Day-to-day -day humiliation. All these. Imagine, this is the West Bank. All those checkpoints, 140 checkpoints, this is what the checkpoints look like. Every day when you will go work and commute, that's what you have to go through. And now here you have Jerusalem. So you have East Jerusalem, West Jerusalem. West Jerusalem, the population... I do apologize, I'm taking a couple of minutes extra, but only be a few minutes. Uh, so you got, the blue is the West Jerusalem. 349,000 Israelis and 4,500 4, Palestinians, that's it. Now you got East Jerusalem, which is meant to be the capital of Palestine, where Masjid Aqsa, etc. are. 220,000 Jews, Israelis, and 345,000 Palestinians. You see, now, why I'm telling, showing you this is here you have the old quarter, Muslim quarter, the Christian quarter, the Armenian quarter, Jewish quarter. And the, the number one there, this one here, is Masjid al-Aqsa and that compound. Why I'm showing you this is, if any of you believe that the Israelis are going to stop and not take Masjid al-Aqsa, you're deluded. 70 years history has shown us that they've literally wiped out the entirety of Palestine. And they're not going to stop, they're going to carry on. This was the same place where only one time in his caliphate over 10 years that Umar ibn al-Khattab left Medina to pick up the keys for Masjid al-Aqsa. Why? Because Umar wanted to be martyred and died in Medina. He never wanted to leave. The only time he ever left in over 10 years was to pick up the key for this place. So brothers and sisters, we have a serious obligation here. If you think, if you think that this issue is going to go away, then you are deluded. Israeli history has shown us that they will take more and more and more and the world will remain silent and the Muslim world will capitulate, but the obligation still lies on me and you. The Prophet wasallam said, go and pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa. Masjid Al-Aqsa wasn't even in the hands of the Muslims. It came in the time of Umar ibn al-Khattab. But he knew that they were going to conquer it. He said, go and pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa. And if you cannot pray two rakats in Masjid Al-Aqsa, then at least send oil to be burnt in the lantern. The ulama said, what does it mean, oil to be burnt in the lantern? The ulama said, what it actually means is that assist Masjid Al-Aqsa. For those who have ever been to Muslim Spain, Muslim Spain was plus 90% Muslims once upon a time. It had the leading scholars in the world. The second largest masjid in the world was the Qurtuba Masjid. The second largest masjid in the world. People like Imam Qurtubi, Ibn Abdul Barr, all the greatest scholars whose names still are mentioned today, lived and prayed in that masjid. When we go there, we go every year, we take a group. When we, you know, when you walk inside, wallahi, you feel the pain, especially if you know the history. When we walk outside, you always hear the same comment from the brothers. Inshallah, one day we will get Masjid Al-Aqsa, we will get Qurtuba Masjid back. You're worried about Qurtuba Masjid, 
and your third holiest masjid is slipping from your hands in front of your eyes wallahi brothers and sisters if it does slip away a hundred years from now muslim will remember you and i the 1.6 billion muslims who daily saw what was going on and did nothing so brothers and sisters practically what can we in the west do i've seen many brothers and sisters writing on social media that we need military intervention from the muslim countries alhamdulillah if that happens alhamdulillah but in the west what can we do firstly we need to get involved in the bds the boycott divestment and sanctions this really does hurt israel actually america and our own country our own government have been pushing back with this because it really does impact the israeli government and it also creates a mentality that this is a apartheid country so that's one thing the second thing is that we need to get involved and pressurize those who are elected with our community the councils the mps we need to ask our masajid to get involved that our masajid need to motivate and move their audience to preserving the sanctity of the third holiest masjid and this is very important you know sometimes you hear especially you hear it more actually within the practicing brothers so oh well, brother there's nothing that we can do oh look 70 years we haven't been able to do no nothing uh, habibi don't cause despondency within the community the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said man qala halaka an-nas fa huwa ahlakum he who says that the people have been destroyed he is the one who has destroyed them because he's created despondency unless you have a better idea and you've implemented that idea then let us know if you haven't then do not stop other people trying to make a change so get involved within the community this is our obligation and the next thing we need to do is that we need to support those voices within our community who defend the muslim cause so alhamdulillah we give immense amount of charity all over the world but those organizations within the uk like friends of al aqsa like cage like men they need a portion of our money because we'll end up in the same situation that france is in 5 million muslims 10% of the entire population and look how they're being treated so we need these organizations and we need now we need a mentality shift that we need these organizations to promote the cause of our community and finally which is really the most important thing because we say iyyaka na'budu wa iyyaka nasta'in allah you alone we worship you alone do we ask for help we ask allah for help we make dua to allah so sincerely with a passion oh allah alleviate the suffering of our brothers and sisters in palestine bring back masjid al-aqsa we make dua that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the tawfiq to do what is pleasing to him we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to elevate the status of our brothers and sisters who are defending masjid al-aqsa we ask allah to grant their shuhada the highest status in jannah we ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give those who are protecting masjid al-aqsa the status of the murabitun Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us united in dunya and reunite us in Jannah for those barakallah fikum salamu alaykum wa rahmatullah